We are now on the chapter of the the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as Wajuh Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I'm gonna go through this reasonably quick because I think Sheikh Abdullah Al Qadi went through uh, some with you and we've actually still got quite a ways to go. I'd really like to get through this text if I can. Um, how many people memorize the uh, the fathers? Nobody? Oh. Hanan? Did you do the Ma'an Shahan, Aqan, Kamin, Kalakhamin, Kachmin, Ammin, Ma'an? It's not. It's easy to do. I taught uh, the son of Sheikh Abdullah Al Qadi in ten minutes. Little Ahmed. It's easy to do. They're good to know. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Also, when you read Sira, you'll know who's who, where they, you know, which father they unite in, things like that. It's it's nice to know. I mean, some of the ulama they consider it mandub. You know, it's not like a wajib, but it's wajib to know he's a Hashemite, Qurayshite. You have to know that. It's a fard. Alright. So the wives, Bayanu Azwaj and Nabi and Mustafa, Sallallahu Alaihi Rabbuna wa Sharrafa. Now for an elucidation of the wives of the of the chosen Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. May our Lord bless and honor him. Wa'iddatul Azwaji Bittifaqi Ayun Ata Wajaa Birbawaki. So there are eleven. Ya is ten, uh, Alif is one. So that's a, he's uh, giving a symbol for 11. So, ayyun ata wa ja'a So the number of wives that are agreed upon are 11. You're going to get a khilaf about this. Some will go 9, 11, uh, even, even more. And it's, sometimes it's because the names, the actual names uh, of the wives uh, cross over. Khurfun tarakna dhikruhu farmuttafaq. Disagreement as to whether they're included among the wives or not. So we will not mention them. As for the first wife, Lady Khadija, we have already made mention. The daughter of Khuwaidid who believed in the Prophet before any other women and for that she rose in the ranks. The ulama say she's the first woman to believe in the Prophet ﷺ. Abu Bakr is the first man and Ali ibn Abi Talib is the first child because he was seven at the time. But uh, Khadij is really the first believer after the Prophet. I mean the Prophet himself is a believer. you know. So uh, I mean he actually used to say I'm meant to be like I believe in myself which is important to, to understand that, that the prophet, the prophet is getting revelation and people can have experiences and doubt themselves, which is initially what happened to him. So, but he, he, he is the first of the believers. So Lady Khadija, radiallahu anha, and then he says, uh, He did not marry any other women besides her as long as she was alive. So... Uh, the Prophet Sallallahu only had one wife uh, until Khadija alayha salam died. ثُمَّ تَزَوَّجْ إِبْنَةَ سِدِّيقِ وَعُمْرَهَا سِتُّنَ عَلَى التَّحْقِيقِ After her death, he contracted the marriage with the daughter of the truthful one, also Sauda, and that you'll get khilaf in the Sira literature. Did he marry Sauda first and then Aisha? But Sauda, he married her... The, the, the contract was, was done with Aisha, but he did not, she did not move into his house. She was still uh, very young. There's khilaf about the age, but in al-Bukhari, the hadith from Aisha anha says that she was six. If you look in, the, in the, uh, the history books and look at the year she died and how old she was, there, some of the ulama say that she, uh, she actually... Uh, was probably 12, some say 15. But, and those are, those are reports, they're just considered weak, which is why he's saying there that the, um, 
you know, that, that means the ulama haqqaq al-mas'ala, and this is what they think is the soundest position. So there are differences of opinion. One of the things today, obviously, because this is such a strange thing for modern people, uh, there, there have been several papers and even booklets written trying to uh, prove those other opinions. Now those opinions, like I said, are there, that she was 12, that she was 15, uh, when she married the Prophet ﷺ, when the actual contract, and then 15 when, when it was consummated. But if you try to apply a modern template onto, onto this period of time, you'll get a lot of problems because this was a different world. And unless you recognize that, uh, you will run into problems in the, in the seerah. The Prophet ﷺ was born into a very different world than we are living in now. Human nature doesn't change, but norms change. Norms, the a'raf of people change. In our urf, this would not be acceptable. And this is a masada urfiya. It's, it's, a, 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 it's a question of urf. It's not, and this is why nobody found this strange. Even when uh, Washington Irving, who wrote his book on the Prophet, uh, the famous people who know Washington Irving, he wrote a book on the Prophet Sallallahu and one of the, uh, one of the um, uh, uh, he wrote the Alhambra, Tales of the Alhambra, and he wrote uh, Rip Van Winkle, people know him from that. But he wrote a life of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu and in that life, he mentions that he married Aisha and consummated the marriage at nine. And then he says, but women of the desert are very precocious. So this is the 1830s, an American that does not use it as a means of attacking the Prophet Sallallahu because in 1830 America, 12 year olds, it was quite normal for a girl of 12 or 13 to get married. In, 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 in America today, there are states, and there's somebody from Alabama here. I'm not making any jokes about Alabama. But there are states where it's permissible to marry uh, a 13 year old, a 12 year old, with consent, you know, adult consent. But people used to get married. When, when, when the period came, a, a, a girl was biologically capable of having children. Now if we look also, it's important to note that Aisha radiallahu is by no means an ordinary person. And she is one of the most extraordinary women that has ever lived. Anybody that does a, a study of her life will conclude that not only was she a genius, Clearly, I'm, I mean, you know, you can look at a person, it's very strange for people that study American history, you have to ask, how is it possible that all these men were living at the same time? You know, John Adams and Thomas Jefferson and, and Alexander Hamilton, very unusual people to be living at the same time, because we don't have that. So, if, but if you look at the Prophet the people around him, and th that he was given as companions, it's just, it's beyond belief. It's so extraordinary. I mean, it's not beyond belief. I'm to be wa rasulihi. But it is extraordinary. And so the Prophet ﷺ, his, 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 uh, his marrying Aisha is uh, very significant. She transmits a third of the religion uh, according to, uh, you know, in, in fiqh, she gives us so many messiah. She solved many of the problems. She was also a brilliant poet, uh, a rawiya of poetry. She knew all the jihadi poetry, and she was raised in the Prophet's house. So she, she would have learned that in the Prophet's house. She was a nasaba, she was a genealogist, she knew the lineage of the Arabs. She was also somebody who um, was very, very uh, independent in her being. Uh, she had her own opinions about things, and she did not suffer fools lightly. She, um, she's, she's just, a, she's a stunning, extraordinary uh, woman in human history. And so, you know, this idea, this attack on the Prophet Sallallahu of today is really quite, it's, 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 it's just an odious, vile, contemptible uh, smear of his personality, of his honor. And I, none of us should be in any way, shape, or form embarrassed by this, but it needs to be understood within the context of the time, the place, and the people. Now, I asked the chief rabbi of, one of the chief rabbis of Israel um, I, at a conference I was at in Europe. 
I asked him in the Torah, in the Talmud, which is their kind of book of narrations and fiqh, and they have all their masail in there. And I asked him, what, what is the youngest that you can marry a, a child, you know, for an adult to marry? And, and he said, there's difference of opinion. They're like us, three rabbis, four opinions. Um, and, and, he, uh, he's, and we have that too, three imams, four opinions, because a lot of imams will have two opinions on something, especially Ahmed ibn Hanbal. Um, he has a lot of masail where they don't know the tarjih. They'll have two opinions, so they'll literally narrate them as two opinions. Um, so he, he told me, he said six is, is, is generally the earliest. And then, and then I said, uh, and what about consummation? He said nine. And then I said, well, what do they do now? He said, well, most rabbis, they'd have to be at least 13 uh, before they would do the marriage. So again, it's a urf. So if you're looking at the Jewish tradition itself, they have the same laws in their tradition. And they know that this is a pre-modern uh, norm. So even though the modern society, I would not personally be happy for anybody in the West to marry a girl that was under 15, you know. Um, I, don't, I don't think it would be uh, appropriate in our environment or conditions. But, it, you know, there are girls now in America that are 12, 13, having children. And they're having sex at, you know, 10 now. So, the, the, you know, these are, this, this is, there's a book by Robert Epstein called The Case Against Adolescence. And he's arguing that you need to start treat, treating young people more like adults because they really are adults. And it's treating them like children that causes all this adolescent behavior. And uh, he has a lot of social science to back up his views. People forget also... Uh, the 50, 60 years ago in the United States, it was quite common for girls 14 to get married. Uh, for people that know uh, William Durant's work, Muriel Durant is the, his wife. He married her when he was, I think, in his early 30s, and she was, I think, 13 years old. And she became a world-class historian under his tutelage and co-wrote that book, The Story of Civilization, uh, which I think is still in print. So, you know, even in our own culture, we do have, uh, we do have that in our past, but not in our present, and that's why it's, for some people, that's a little difficult. Anyway, I, you know, I, I elaborated on that just because it is an issue that does come up, but I think it's very important to recognize that Aisha radilanu by merely reading the hadith with Aisha, you will come very quickly to recognize that this was not a, a, a little girl. This was a very dynamic, mature, young uh, woman who stood her own ground with the Prophet ﷺ himself, disagreed with him on more than one occasion. If you want to know the level of her erudition, um, for those who know Arabic, the hadith of Umm Zara uh, will show you the type of erudition, Qad Iyad wrote a, a, a commentary on that book that was published in Morocco, but it's where the nine women come together and each one, they, they all make an oath that they're going to tell the truth about their husbands and, and they, they, each one, and Umm Zara tells about Abu Zara and how much she loved him and, and how good he was. The other ones kind of complain about their husbands generally. Um, but Umm Zara doesn't complain, but then he got married, he took a second wife, and she got jealous, and he ended up divorcing her, and then she, was, she got another husband who was good, he was giving her everything, but she was unhappy with him, because all she could think about was Abu Zara. So the Prophet said, you're like Umm Zara to, to, to me. In other words, don't let these other women destroy the relationship that we have. So he was just letting her know that... Uh, because she, she was a jealous lady. She had ghayra, and ghayra is a normal uh, function of people. Men have it and women have it. There's nothing wrong. A woman not wanting their husband to take a second wife is not about iman, like your iman's weak or something like that. I mean, some of the men will say that your iman's weak. You know, it's not weak iman. 
it's a normal fitra thing that Allah has put into men and women, uh, which is why in the Maliki Madhab, I mean, there's a, I don't know if you read the Saudi Gazette this morning. Did anybody read it? There's a horrible article. Don't read that newspaper. You, you just get depressed. But there's a horrible article about people taking second wives and then basically using them as maids. It's a, it's a front page article. I mean, thank God I, people don't read this stuff in America. You know, if, if they read these, I mean, they're on websites and things, but it's not common thing. But it, it, it's really disturbing. I'm glad at least they're talking about it, which is a good sign you know, that the country is changing a little bit, because these type things they never used to mention in the newspapers. So the fact that they are talking about it is actually a good sign. But, you know, it was just women getting into these second marriages and then finding out that it, they would just wanted them as a servant that they didn't have to pay for. Uh, so it was, it was quite sad. So that, but they mentioned that now the women are learning about stipulations like that a husband can't get a second wife and they put in the little newspaper article even though God permitted it well he also permitted a woman to stipulate that she didn't want a second wife so it goes both ways Do you know but again it's this thing of oh it's my right it's not a right you know like a haq it's haqi it's not a haq you know it's it's a, it's a permissibility it's a rukhsa and uh you know, if a woman is not comfortable in that situation, she has every right not to be comfortable, and she can request a divorce and things like that. So, anyway, the Birbadar Haram Yaqabret Hijra bi Sanatani and Ahl al Khibra. So she married the Prophet in Mecca in the sacred precinct before his migration by two years. And then there's a khidaf about that. There's a khidaf about when she was born. Some say was, she was born in the second year of hijrah. Some say in the fourth year of hijrah. Some say she was born before the hijrah. So this is where you get the khidaf about her age. But this hadith in al-Bukhari, she narrates it. And she states that she was uh, bintu sitin. You know, I was, I was uh, six years of age. ثم بنى بها بعيد مرتحل لطيبة وعمرها تسعة وصل. He consummated the marriage shortly after his migration to the Pure Land when she reached the age of nine. Now consummation here بنى بها. We don't know if it was consummated at that point, but she came into his household at that point. She came into his household, and the point that she came into the household was when she was no longer playing with the toys. So it was a sign that she had moved out of that childhood uh, phase. وَمَاتَ عَنْهَا وَهِيَ بِنْتُ حَيَّنْ صَلَّ عَلَيْهِ رَبُّ كُلِّ شَيَّنْ So when he died, she was 18 years old. Ha is 10, uh, is 8, and ya is 10. So حَيِّ is 18. صَلَّ عَلَيْهِ رَبُّ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ so when, when she was 18 years of age, may the Lord of all things bless him. Um, the chosen one had not married any other virgin besides her, and for that she had a great honor. She once said to the Prophet Sallallahu what's better to, for, if you, if you have your animals, you graze in land, you know, the unuf, the land that animals haven't grazed in before, or, or the land that animals have grazed in before. And you know, he said, well, the one that the animals haven't grazed in before. So she was trying to show him the qiyas about that she was a virgin, and so it's a better. And he just said, nobody is, was better than Khadija. George Bernard Shaw said an amazing thing. Uh, he said, <laughs> he said uh, you know, that the Prophet him, he knew that he was a truthful man when he read that story, because he said that normally a man would lie in a situation like that because it's the woman that he's with and, and to say that, oh, I preferred my previous wife um, would just not be something most men would do. They would just say, oh, yes, of course, I love you much better than her. You know? But because truthfulness was his nature and he could not do that, he said even in that type of situation where a white lie would be expected, he was, he was honest. صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم
وكم حوات في مدة يسيرة من العلوم الجمة الغزيرة and how many subjects in such a short time did she master this is what's so stunning because she really did master the Arabic language the lineage of the Arabs all the poetry uh, and then fiqh tafsir she learned all of these things with the Prophet she had a prodigious memory and uh, really quite extraordinary and, and that's why we believe that she was chosen for that the Prophet actually saw in a dream uh, so it wasn't something that um, I mean, he was commanded to do that and Abu Bakr she, she was actually engaged to somebody before that and this is also this was the urf of the Arabs you know they, they would make engagements as children even some of the boys I mean it wasn't just the women the boys would be engaged people would make deals I'll marry you, my daughter, you marry, you know, we'll marry them together when, when they were still little babies. Uh, in the Arabian Peninsula, that still happens to a certain degree, arranged marriages in that way, families that have known from the beginning, you know, my son's going to marry your daughter. So. And then, she was buried in the graveyard of Baqi' in the 58th year. So noon is 50, ha is 8. Uh, acquiring copious and multitudinous knowledge of them. So, uh, no, sorry. Uh, she was born, buried in the graveyard of Baqi' in the 58th year of Hijr during the night. And Soda, who was aged, uh, gave her night with the Prophet to Aisha. فَوَهَبَتْ لَيْلَتَهَا لَهَا لِكَيْ تُحْشَرَ فِي أَزْوَاجِهِ بِنْتُ لُؤَيْ so she was, uh, Lu'ay is one of the grandfathers of the Prophet ﷺ. Uh, and uh, he, she gave her night to Aisha. Um, she, she was actually quite old when the Prophet ﷺ married her. And uh, she, was, she was a very heavy set woman. And uh, so the Prophet ﷺ, uh, Soda said she, she wanted to stay with him as a wife and she wanted to give her night. Uh, to Aisha, so that's what she did. وبعد موت زوجها سكراني تزوجت خير بني عدناني. After the death of her husband as Sakran, she married the best of the clan of Adnan. صلى عليه ربنا وسلم وآري وصحبي وكرما وهاجر في الدين هجرتين جزاهما الرحمن وجنتين. Both Soda and her previous husband made the two migrations. May the merciful reward them both with the two highest gardens. So she went to Al Habasha and she also made the second Hijrah. There was a special honor in doing that. وعم ندن في خلافة عمر. In the 54, uh, uh, in, in the year 54, during the, the Kedifat of Omar, radiallahu anhu, she died uh, in, so noon is 50, dal is 4, she died in the Pure Land. So study the history. Tufiyat bi qaybatan faqhu al-athar. Wa hafsatun tazawwajat khayr al-bashar ba'd khunayshin thumma ramma an sadar. Uh, and Hafsa also married the best of men after the martyrdom of Khunaysh and then after he talaquha minhu bi raddiha umir wa mawtuha amal jama'ati dhukir divorced her he was commanded by God to accept her back so the Prophet Sallallahu divorced Hafsa in a, in a, the talqa wahida the anti tariq is the first uh, divorce um, and then took her back وزينب أم المساكين قتل بأحد عنها ابن جحش فقبر. When Zainab, the mother of the poor, lost her husband Ibn Jahsh, uh, he was a martyr at Uhud. Um, the Prophet ﷺ also married her. تزوجت خير نبي وثوات شهرين أو ثلاثة ثم توات. So she married the best Prophet and lived with him for only two or three months, and then she passed away. ولم يموت حياته من النساء إلا خديجة وذي فقتبسة. So during his life, none of his wives died except for Lady Khadija and Zainab. So seize this knowledge. These are the only two that died. All the others survived uh, his death. صلى الله عليه وسلم. وبنت جحش بنت عمة الرسول زوجها الرحمن باري العقول. Another wife is bint Jahsh, uh, Zainab, who's the daughter of the messenger's paternal aunt. The Merciful himself, the creator of reason, married her to the best of the Prophet. To the best uh, uh, Prophet after Zayd had ran his course with her, and she died during the Caliphate of Omar. Now, Zainab, 
the, the Prophet ﷺ knew her from Mecca. And uh, so the narration that he saw her at the door and all that is complete uh, nonsense. Um, that somehow he became infatuated with her. He knew Zainab very well. Um, they're from the same family. And uh, uh, the Prophet ﷺ she loved the Prophet, and the Prophet married her to Zayd. The marriage was very difficult for her. She was an aristocrat. She was from the Quraysh. Zayd was, uh, was somebody that um, she just was not happy with. And uh, so when the Prophet ﷺ was told to marry her, and he told Zayd, Zayd was very happy that the situation was going to be resolved. He was also, because he was the adopted son of the Prophet ﷺ, it was a problem for the Arabs because the Arabs believed that adoption, like the Romans, the Romans used to adopt, and when you adopted a son, he actually was like a blood lineage. He inherited everything. He became uh, part of the family in the same way a, a, a blood son would. So the Prophet ﷺ, when he uh, was commanded to marry her, that was also abrogating that practice of adoption. Now, adoption is a, is, is, it, there's a lot of really interesting social science about the dangers of adoption where the child is not aware that it's not the, the, the biological son it's very import, or daughter. It's very important that people know that. Adoption in Islam is kafala. We don't have tabenni in that they don't take the last name. They keep the last name that they were born with. Um, if they know it, if they don't know it, then, then, then that's a different situation. But if they know it, they do not change the name. They keep that uh, biological knowledge of who they are, and they're not told. Uh, John Taylor Gatto wrote a book on, on adoption that he could not find a publisher for because the social science was so scathing. He told me this himself. Um, several of the serial killers in the United States were in adopted families where they were not told that they were uh, the biological, they were not the biological children. They were living a lie, basically. And that's, that, it's very harmful for the psychology of uh, a person. They need to know um, who they are. So that, that practice was abrogated by Islam. And, and, and this was part of that process, but it was also um, to unite this woman with uh, the man that she really, truly loved. And so, um, so that, that's, that marriage took place. إِذْ فُتِحَتْ مِصْرُ وَكَانَتْ أَطْوَرَ نِسَائِهِ يَتَنْ كَمَا قَدْ نُقِرَ while Egypt was conquered, all of his wives, she died during the caliphate of Omar. She was the most open-handed in her generosity, as has been narrated. Uh, the, the, uh, the Prophet ﷺ once mentioned about uh, the, having the, the longest hand, and the, the wives took all their hands. They started measuring them to see who had the longest <laughs> hand. But it was actually a, it was a kinaya for generosity, like just a type of... Uh, وَهِنْدٌ هِيَ كَمْ لَهَا مِنْ فَضْرِي تَزَوَّجَتْ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَوْتَ الْبَعْلِ Next there is Hind, and what a virtuous woman she also married after her spouse died. خَيْرَ الْوَرَى وَفِي خِلَافَةِ يَزِيد فِي عَمِي سِتِّينَ أَقَضَتْ بِلَا مَزِيد The best of creation during the caliphate of Yazid in the 60th year she passed away when no time was left. وَبِالْبَقِيعِ دُفِّنَتْ وَهَاجَرَا تِنْتَيْنِ فِي أَوَّلِ مَا قَدْ هَاجَرَا So in Baqi' she's buried, رحمها الله رضي الله عنها. And also she uh, is somebody who made the hijrah twice. She was in Habasha. وَمِنِّي سَأَلْ مُصْطَفَى جُوَيْرِيَّةِ تُوفِيَتْ فِي عَامِ نَوْئِ لِتَدْرِيَّةِ So uh, she was... Uh, included among the women of the chosen one is Juwayriya. Uh, she died in the year 56. The the uh, the noon is 50, and then the ra the uh, wow is six. Um, so you should know. وَقَدْ سَبَاهَا فِي غَزَةِ الْمُصْطَلِقِ مِنْ بَعْدِهَا مُسَافِعٍ بِالْمُنْدَرِقِ So initially she was taken as a concubine after the battle of Mustalik. Uh, from her husband Musafi' who died later by sword. So she was, uh, 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 she was,
So the Prophet ﷺ paid Ibn Qais who held her for, for her manumission and then he married her and because he married her all of the Sahaba freed the, these prisoners from her tribe. So she was considered a great blessing for her tribe because once she became married they were the Ashar of the Prophet ﷺ. so out of honor to the Prophet they freed her tribe's people. Uh, after that, إِذْ أَرْسَلَ النَّاسُ السَّبَايَ طُرَّا رَمَّا غَدَ الْمُسْتَرَقِ سِهْرَا For all the Muslims freed their captives from her clan when they realized the entire Mustaraqi clan were now the in-laws of لِلْمُسْتَفَى عَلِيهِ مِنْ رَبَّ الْأَنَامِ وَآلِهِ أَسْكَ الصَّرَاتِ وَالسَّلَامِ In-laws of the Chosen One from the Lord of Creation, His family, the purest blessings and peace. وَرَمْلَةٌ بِنْتُ أَبِي سُفْيَانَ تَزَوَّجَتْ خَيْرَ الْوَرَى وَكَانَ And then Ramla, also the daughter of Abu Sufyan, uh, married uh, the Prophet ﷺ and her guardian, وَرِيُّهَا خَالِدَنَ وَعِثْمَانَ عِنْدَ النَّجَاشِ كَمَا أَتَانَ Her guardian in the marriage was Khalid or Uthman and according to history she was with the Najis when the Prophet's proposal came. فَسَلَّمَ الْمَهْرَ إِلَيْهَا أَجْمَعَا مِنَ الدَّنَانِيرِ مَآتٍ أَرْبَعَا And the Negus gave the dowry in its entirety to her himself, which compromised 400 gold dinars. وَعَامَ سَبْعٍ أُهْدِيَتْ لِأَحْمَدَا وَمَوْتُهَا فِي عَامِ مَدِّ قَدْ بَدَا In the seventh year after Hijrah, she was given in marriage to Ahmed, and her death occurred in the year 44 after Hijrah. Um, so... Uh, the meme is 40, the dal is 4. وَكَمْ حَوَتْ مِنْ شَرَفٍ صَفِيَّا لَمَا غَدَتْ لِأَكَنُ مِنْ الْبَرِيَّا And what an honor was gained by Safiya when she too became the noblest of creation's spouse. وَزَوْجًا وَكَانَتْ سُبِيَتْ فِي خَيْبَرَا فَاخْتَارَهَا لِنَفْسِهِ خَيْرُ الْوَارَا She had been captured as a concubine at Khaybar and the best of creation chose her for himself. She was also, she was married uh, to one of the leaders of the, uh, the Jews of Khaybar, uh, and Huyay, who really instigated this whole thing. She actually had a dream, uh, which was interpreted as that the Prophet sent him, she would marry him, and she told her husband, and he slapped her. So she still had the, the athar on her face from being uh, hit by her husband. Um, when, when she married... When she married the Prophet she became Muslim. Um, she was, it's very interesting because she, the, some of the other women used to chide her about being a Jew, Yahudiya. And the Prophet uh, when, when she mentioned that to him, she said, tell them that your, your father is Harun. She was an Aaronite. Tell them that your father is Harun. Your mother, your uh, your uncle is Moses, and your husband is Muhammad. In other words, that it's a point of sharaf uh, that the Jews are people. The Muslims tend to forget that they're actually children of prophets. So it's it was a point of sharaf for her with her iman in the Prophet Sallallahu She was also accused of uh, during the fitan during Uthman's period. She was accused of being. Uh, a Jewess. So, I mean, it's quite, it's quite sad, the ignorance that um, pervades communities. And the, the early Muslims certainly weren't immune from that. But during that time, she was considered being a Jewess, observing the Sabbath. And then, um, uh, so Uthman asked her about that. And she said that she went on the Saturday, she would visit her relatives who were Jews. And... Uh, so that she's a very interesting uh, person also, and um, to rem you know to remember that the Prophet Sallallahu had Jewish uh, relatives then also, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and then he says. Um, Her freedom was her dowry, a right he gave her in the, in the year 50, death descended and took her. So in the seventh year, just after the victory of Khaybar, during the Umrah, he married Maymuna, and she was the one that Allah says in the Quran, وَهَبَتْ نَفْسَهَا لِلنَّبِي صلى الله عليه وسلم when Mu'minatun wahabat nafsaha, she actually gave herself to the Prophet. She came to the Prophet. 
So now we all visited Seref, so that's a place that you know now. And then she was buried there 45 years later, which is really quite extraordinary. She was the last among the women to marry him without any doubts. In the year 51, death too descended upon her when her appointed time arrived for the taking of her soul. Uh, so the uh, the dowry of each of these wives was 500 silver dirhams with the exception of Safiya um, and Ramla whose dowries were mentioned earlier in a clarification of what he paid to them both. So the Prophet Sallallahu gave uh, the dowries was 500 silver dirhams. He would have, that would be the Urf uh, and the Prophet Sallallahu um that's the, that was a reasonable amount of money, uh, especially uh, at that time in that type of society. Um, but obviously the negus, his uh, was was a lot of uh, money because it was gold. Now he says uh, concerning the children of the Prophet, أَوْلَادُهُ بَيَانُوا أَوْلَادَ النَّبِيِّ أَحْمَدَ صَلَّى عَلَيْهِ رَبُّنَا وَمَجَّدَ أَبْنَاؤُهُ أَرْبَعَةٌ فِيمَا وَرَادَ عَلَيْهِ اَخْتِلَافٍ جَاءَ فِي هَذَا الْعَدَدِ his sons are four, according to what's mentioned. However, some disagreement about that particular number has occurred. Some say they're three, and they they because of the uh, the the laqab. So uh, you'll find that, but but generally it's four. فالقاسم الذي به قد كنيا وبعد عبد الله أيضا دعيا. Their qasim, who the Prophet was called in kunya. Kunya is like when you have a son or a daughter, and you're called by their name, Abu, Abu Maryam. The Prophet is called Abu Zahra, which is the father of Fatima. The Prophet ﷺ was called Abu Qasim. He's Abu Abdullah. He's Abu Tahir. He has those kuna are, are in his name. The Prophet ﷺ, the, um, during his lifetime, he said, لا تكنوا بكنيتي. Don't use my kunya to, for confusion. Some of the ulama took that as being a prohibition even after his death. Um, Libya is a place, you know, Abul Qasim is a common name, um, probably more from the, the great Maliki scholar, Abul Qasim. But um, it's permissible to name with his kunya. The Turks did not like to call people Muhammad Sallallahu so they changed it to Mehmet. And the reason they did that is because Sayyidina Omar said that he did not like naming the children Muhammad because of people cursing or getting angry and, and using the name. Like, Muhammad, what's wrong with you? Something like that, or getting uh, mad. I mean, I, was, I, I screened a, uh, a cartoon. I was asked to watch a cartoon on the life of the Prophet for to criticize it. And there was one scene where they had Abu Jahal <coughs> cursing the Prophet in the cartoon. I was just like, you know, little kids watch this. And, they, and they'll say these things. You know, just kids watch those things hundreds of times. Um, so I just thought that was totally unacceptable to put that in a children's film. But that's why they did that. The Turks, out of Adab, they actually changed the name Muhammad to Mehmet, just as a way of honoring the Prophet Sallallahu name. Uh, and then he says, uh, So here's where the difference comes. Tayyib and Tahir, both of which are one and the same, or some opine that they differ. And then, so that you have uh, Qasim and then Abdullah and then Tayyib and Tahir. Some say that they're, uh, they're, they're the, the different people, but the dominant opinion is that they're the same. And then the fourth among them, Ibrahimu The fourth of the sons, all of these were from Khadija except for Ibrahim was from Maria al Qabtiya. And he technically. 
was she was an um walad. That's the strongest opinion that she. That's what, he didn't even mention her amongst the wives. She was an um walad. She was sent by Muqawqis from Egypt to the Prophet Sallallahu and then Banabiha, a woman if she's in a uh, if she's an ama and she misses a period even, then she moves into a, a, a status that is akin to the wife. She doesn't have, uh, it's not completely the same as a wife, but she's, she's no longer an emma. So she can't, she can't be uh, given away or something like that. So she, Maria Qaptiya is uh, uh, the mother of uh, Ibrahim Miraduhu bi taibatan mardiyya wa ummuhu mariyatul qaptiyya. So his birthplace was the city of Tayba, the pleasing, and his mother was Mary al Qaptiya. Kanat al Khayri Mursalin Suriyah, Salla Ali Kharik al Bariya. She was the best messenger's concubine, so she was sent. Again, this is a pre modern phenomenon. It's not certainly something that uh, the modern world can uh, grapple with anymore, but this was definitely pre modern. It's biblical. Um, it was in pre-modern cultures. The Prophet ﷺ freed all of uh, the slaves, um, and certainly inc- his slaves, and certainly encouraged the, the freeing of slaves. The Quran encourages the freeing of slaves. The Prophet ﷺ said that the person who has a, a slave girl frees her, educates her, marries her, and gets two reward. It, like the Christian who becomes Muslim gets two reward. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi praised that act. But again, this is a pre-modern uh, condition that was, uh, it was uh, rampant throughout the world. Uh, you know, and just a point here. We have so much uh, on this planet. If you look at the United Nations estimates of sexual slavery, of uh, the... Uh, you know, prostitution, of all of these things that women are for. I mean, there's a massive problem in this here, in this region, with prostitution, because you have so many poor people that come uh, and, and are forced into these conditions. So, you know, when, when you look at the pre-modern world, in many ways what, what the, this Sharia was trying to do was do tahdeeb of human conditions that are actually quite... Uh, odious and one of those human conditions is uh, impoverished refugee status when you have wars do you know how many refugees now in Iraq there's there's almost two million from from the war I mean there's all these people out here begging you know on I mean I don't know if there's some of them aren't but some of them might be from Iraq but this is what happens when you have these situations and so in 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 Islam it Literally, Jeffaf al Manabi, it completely dried up all the sources of slavery except as a way of reintegrating uh, prisoners of war uh, and things like that back into society. And this is one of the ways. So the Prophet uh, really, the Islam eliminated all the sources of slavery, and the Muslims never developed a uh, a, a type of chattel slavery that, that was developed in the West. The, the slavery in the Islamic tradition, the rules are very rigid. You can't split families up. You can't, I mean, pe- 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 people were split up in, in other systems. Personally, it's a good thing that I think all the Muslim countries have eliminated it. I certainly would not like to see it come back. Um, when people read these verses in the Quran, I get asked about that a lot. You know, what's that mean, my medical I mean, this, this is the pre-modern world. And, and the Prophet Sallallahu his sharia came in the midst of that. And at the time, and remember also that the Prophet Sallallahu his sharia is a sharia of tadarruj. It's not a sharia that comes and does this revolutionary act that turns everybody upside on their heads. Wine was eliminated very slowly. Um, uh, even even the fornication, if you can look at it, the Prophet ﷺ permitted a type of marriage that by our standards today would be uh, just unacceptable. 
and that's why it's prohibited now. But initially he permitted that because these people were not used to the, the types of laws that uh, Islam was, was really moving people towards. So the, uh, the muta'a, which is a pleasure marriage, uh, the Prophet permitted that initially, and it was something that the Arabs uh, used, um, but then he prohibited it. And so there's a lot of tadarruj in the sharia, and this is certainly uh, one of the areas where if, if you read the sharia, if you read the Qur'an, وَمَا أَدْرَكَ مَا الْعَقَبَةَ فَكُّ رَقَبَةَ is the very first thing, which is the quickest way to get to God, is to free slaves. Uh, also, إِنَّمَا الصَّدَقَاتُ لِلْفُقَرَاءِ وَالْمَسَاكِينِ وَالْعَامِلِينَ عَلَيْهَا وَفِي الرِّقَابِ That the charity is for the poor people, the miskeen, I mean, Shafi'i and Maliki differ on faqir and miskeen. Uh, the Shafi'is have the exact opposite of the Malikis, but they do differentiate. You know, in the Maliki Madhab, miskeen la yamliku shay'an. He doesn't even have a day's worth of provision. In, and the faqir is yamliku quta sanatihi. He has a, a year's worth of provision. So he's, 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 not a, uh, he's a poor person in that way. What, right? What's Shafi's? Huh? Yeah, the miskeen's better than the faqir. Yeah. So it's the opposite in the Maliki. So it's a, a khidaf. But the. Um, let's see. So anyway, I mean, I'm, the reason I'm focusing on some of these shubuhat is because living in the West. I mean, unfortunately, there's people, some people are finding out about all the horrors of Islam before they actually find out about Islam. And there's whole websites dedicated to this stuff. I mean, it's quite tragic. So there's a lot of people that, um, this is their attitude about Islam. So they're going to come to you with things, well, what about this and what about this? And Islam says this and Islam says that. So, uh, you know, I think it's just important for people to, to have some uh, understanding of this. I mean, this, this area, which is really apologetics, um, and, and apologia is a Greek word that, that means defense. You know, it doesn't mean like saying I'm sorry, uh, which is what it means in modern English. An apology is actually a defense. Like in Socrates, uh, Plato's famous uh, dialogue. It's called the Apologia. It's, it's Socrates' defense of why he did what he did. It's not saying, I'm sorry. He was actually telling him, you know, uh, that he wasn't sorry. And, and when they asked him to mete out a punishment for himself, he said that he thought they should give him free meals for the rest of his life for the great service he was doing to the citizens of Athens by acting as a gadfly. So the point is, is that the apology is a defense. So apologetic Literature traditionally is literature that deals with what's called radd shubuhat which is to refute the obfuscations. Obfuscations are things that are unclear, they're, they're murky areas, they're things that are, uh, people bring up to create doubt in people's minds. And that is an obligation of scholars to refute uh, these type of things. And unfortunately, there's, there, we, we're really suffering from this uh, uh, today, with so many people working full time, I mean, some of the budgets these people have, it's they're they're in the millions. There's one organization that is solely dedicated to attacking Islam and undermining Islam, and they have a budget of over 20 million dollars in the U.S. a year. So it's you know it's very real. Now, I would also say for that it's important when you're dealing with secularists, it's very difficult because they don't believe in religion. But Christians and Jews, our Sharia is so much more enlightened than the, 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 what exists in the Jewish and the Christian dispensations that are there today. If you read St. Thomas Aquinas and look at Canaan law, the, you know, the Christian uh, legal tradition, there's nothing... Uh, in Islam that compares to things that you find. I mean, torture. We never justified torture. Torture was justified by the Bible, the New Testament. 
I mean, the Christians, the Catholics actually justified torture, that it was actually a good thing to torture people until they confessed because you were, even though you were harming their body, you were saving their soul. So that's, you know, that is in their books. Whereas Muslims never in the history of Islam has anybody ever justified torture. Imam Malik in his madhab for somebody who was a convicted criminal of past crimes that they said it was permissible to rough him up a bit if he was uh, captured and was not admitting to the crime but there was enough circumstantial evidence but it wasn't like torture him it was more do the hard cop soft cop type thing but other than that the the ulama prohibited ta'dib and the prophet said that the worst people on the yom al-qiyamah the, the most Tortured souls on the Day of Judgment are people who tortured people in this world. So torture was never justified by Islam, never in the history of Islam. And many, many other examples of that. So I think it's important uh, for people to remember that, that you know, with secularists, they just don't accept anything um, from religion. But with, when you're dealing with Christians and, and Jews, they have to understand if you live in a glass house, you don't throw stones. That, that, uh, that we can look at their traditions. And unfortunately, some Muslims have. I mean, you know, one of the famous du'ats who sp spent a lot of time really making fun of the Bible, that is not a healthy thing to do for Muslims because that antagonizes people and they'll actually end up doing the same thing, which is why the Quran says, Do not curse the idols. Because initially the Prophet used to speak ill of their idols. But they, the, 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 uh, the Quraysh began to actually curse the religion and curse Islam and curse Allah. And so the, the, the Prophet was told, don't speak ill of their idols. Because the father is sababiyya. It will cause the sibab of God. You know, without any, you know, uh, there's no right for them to do that. But they'll do it just because they're angry at you. So it's important for Muslims to remember that, that if you're going to make fun of other people's religions, you're only setting your own religion up to be made fun of. And that's why it's very important in our dialogues, in our speaking, to speak with respect about what people hold sacred. Uh, hoping that they would in turn respect us. وَكُلُّهُمْ قَبْلَ الْبُلُوغِ مَاتُوا حَيَاتُهُ كَمَا رَوَثِّقَاتُ So all of his sons died before reaching maturity during his life as relayed by reliable authorities. أَمَّا بَنَاتُهُ فَأَرْبَعُونَ بِلَا خُلْفٍ وَفِي الْكُبْرَى خِلَافٌ نُقِلَى As for his daughters, they are also four in number without descent. Though among concerning his oldest, some difference was mentioned. The soundest opinion states Zainab is the eldest, but they differed about her age in relation to Al Qasim. One group said she's older than him, another said she's younger. The birth order of the other three is Ra'fun. So Ra and then Hamza and then Fa. Ruqayya, Um Kothum, and then Fatima. So that's the birth order. So the oldest one is Zainab and then Ra'fun, which is Ruqayya, Um Kothum, and then uh, Fatima as Zahra. وفي ثلاثين لعمر فيري قد ولد زينب الرسول in the thirtieth year following the year of the elephant زينب was born to the messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم وابن الربيع ينكحت فلما أرسل خير مرسلا ألما and she was married to ابن ربيع so when the best of creation was chosen he was summoned به قريش في فراق زينب فلم يجيبهم للفراق بل أبا فأسلمت وهاجرت وهاجر من بعدها فردها خير الوراء so the Quraysh told him to leave Zainab and he would not. And then she accepted Islam and immigrated and Ibn Rabi'ah immigrated after her. So the best of creation restored her once 
uh, he accepted Islam to the previous marriage contract according to the soundest report, not needing a second contract. There's a very important fiqh point that's brought out from that, and that is that Islam recognizes marriage because the, the basis of, the, of marriage is the prophets. That's where the institution of marriage came from. It's a prophetic tradition. And so anybody who marries before Islam, even a civil marriage, when they, come, when they accept Islam, the marriage is accepted. I mean, it's very important to understand that, that, that for illegitimacy, and even Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayyana, and I really prefer this opinion, because uh, I asked him about this. I said, we have a major problem in the West, is that people do not get married anymore, so we have illegitimacy. Now, that word is becoming illegitimate in the West. To say illegitimate is becoming, it's not even accepted anymore. I don't love child or whatever you call them, I don't know. But, um, but w- the reality of it is that we have a orf now in our society in the West that people live together and are committed to each other. And they might not call it marriage, but it's a sen- we, we call it common law marriage. It's a type of orf. And so children that are born in those type of situations should not be considered illegitimate. If they know who their father was, the father was committed to the wife, they were living together, they should not be considered Ill- illegitimate children. So that's important. And it's important for fiqh because you know, illegitimate children shouldn't be prayer leaders, things like that. And it's not because they have any sin. It's just because the, the imam is supposed to be an exemplar. They're supposed to be taken from people that other people look up to. Um, that orf is changing quite radically in, in, in the West. In England, I, I don't, and there's a lot now. I don't know what the rates are. But in America, it's over 50% are born now out of wedlock. So... If they're common law, we, we should consider, if they become Muslim, you know, converts and things like that, if they're common law, then they shouldn't be, it shouldn't be seen as illegitimate. Wallahu um, alam, Allah knows best. فوردت أمامة عرية له وماتت عام حن وفية. So she bore her husband أمامة علي and she died in the eighth year of هجرة. وأنكحت رقية عتيبة وأم كثوم أخاه عتبة. And رقية was married to عتيبة and أم كثوم to his brother عتبة. فطلقاهما معا إذ نزل so because they were uh, children of Abu Lahab, when Abu Lahab, when the Tabbat Yada, Abi Lahab bin Watab was revealed, they divorced the, uh, the, the, um, the, the daughters. What's interesting about Tabbat Lada, it's a very harsh surah, but he was a very harsh person. I mean, he was like just unbelievable what he did to the Prophet. But it's very interesting. It's the only real ta'yeen in the Qur'an of anybody from, by name. And the fact that he did not become Muslim is quite extraordinary. Uh, Abu Lahab. And it's, I mean, that, that's one of the miracles of the Qur'an because so many of those people did become Muslim, but he did not, nor did Um Jamil. ثم تزوج ابن عفان الرضا رقية أتت بنجن فقضاء. So the, then Ibn Affan, the well-pleasing, married رقية, who bore him a son, who then died. She died when he came back from Badr. Uh, she she had died uh, during that while he was at Badr. وابن ست ثم بعد موت الأم في سنة إثنتين بغير وهمي in the sixth year after the death of his mother in the second year after هجرة without any ambiguity. وأنكح الأخرى بدون ميني ومن هنا رقب ذو النورين 
And then he, the other daughter, Um Kulthum, was most assuredly married to him, and for that he was entitled possessor of the two lights. So Uthman anhu married both of, of the daughters of the Prophet ﷺ. She bore him no children, and in the ninth year she passed away as tradition cites. So the Prophet ﷺ buried all of his children, with the exception of Fatima. And Fatima, he told her in the famous uh, hadith on his deathbed, he called her over and he whispered in her ear and she uh, cried. And then he whispered in her ear and she laughed. Um, and, and they asked her later and she said, he told me that I would be the first to follow him in death. And she died six months later. And then she said, and you'll be the first with me in paradise. So uh, uh, Fatima is the only one that he did not bury though. وبنت خير المرسلين الصغرى أسمى نساء العالمين قدرا مولودها في عام أم كان من مقدم الفيري ولما بان لها من الأعمام من الأعوام خمسة عشر زوجها حيدرة خير البشر فولدت له من الأولاد بنتين وابنين بلا عناد الحسن الحسين ثم زينب وأم كثوم إليه إليهم تنسب Uh, so then he's, she says, uh, he says that the youngest daughter of the best of all creation is the most exalted in rank among the women of the world. The Prophet ﷺ mentioned Maryam, Asya, Khadija, and Fatima. The, the Prophet ﷺ said that she was from the Kummal, the complete women. Um, the, she certainly, her maqam is amazing, Fatima. She's also the source of the Al-Bayt. Uh, is are through her. Um, she when she her birthday was in the forty first year after the arrival of the elephant. She reached fifteen full years of her life when the best of creation married her to the lion, Haydar is the name of Imam Ali Radilanu. She went on to bear for him four children, two boys and two girls without debate. So Al Hassan and Al Hussein, you'll also see Hassan and Hussein without the Ta'rif. Uh, Al Hassan and Al Hussein And now the story, and this is in Tuhfat al-Mawlud, Ibn Qayyim al jawziyah relates an interesting story that Ali, when she was, when, 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 because he gives it as pr uh, proof that you can marry, a, you can name a child while it's still in the stomach, even though the sunnah is to name them once they're born, uh, but it's permissible to name them in the stomach. So Sayyidina Ali, when he told the Prophet that, Zay, that Fatima was pregnant, he said, what are you going to name the boy and he said harb and so the like war and the prophet said so he said no his name is al hasan so he said all right so he was born al hasan then then when she became pregnant with al hussein he went back uh, told the prophet he said what are you going to name him he said harb <laughs> and he said no his name is al hussein so he named him al hussein she was pregnant with a third boy who died and the prophet said went the uh, ali said told him she was pregnant again and he said what are you going to name he said harb <laughs> and he said no his name's muhsin so these are the three names the prophet gave al hasan al hussein and muhsin and it's all about beauty so the arabs say nusammi abna'ana li a'da'ina wa khadamana li anfusina You know, it was the Jahili tradition to give your children very harsh names and give your servants, like slaves and things, beautiful names. So you have, it's a funny thing, like the Arabs have these, whenever you look at the, the Abid and the Mawali, they have very nice names uh, in, in the Sira and Jahili literature. And then a lot of them, they have names like Saif and Husam and Muhannad and Talha and... Uh, Utba, these type of uh, names, Nimr, Fahad. Uh, but they, they said, we name our children for our enemies and we name our servants for ourselves. So that was kind of an a, a Arab Jahali mentality, is that you wanted children, because they were the ones that fought, you wanted them to be tough in battle. Uh, and so you gave them tough names. But the Prophet gave them very beautiful names. And then, وَوَرَدَتْ رُقَيَّةً وَمُحْسِنًا She also bore رُقَيَّةً and مُحْسِنًا uh, أَيْضًا وَمَاتَ فِي الصِّبَى وَدُفِنًا So both of them died in infancy and were buried. ثُمِّ بْنُ جَعْفَرٍ بَنَا بِزَيْنَبِي فَوَرَدَتْ رَهُ عَرِيًّا وَحُبِي 
uh, and then Ibn Ja'far consequently bi ukhtiha al-Faruq hatta waladat Zaydan lahu wa ba'aduhu tazawwajat and al-Faruq was blessed to marry her sister who would give birth to his son Zayd Muhammad ibn Ja'far wa idh mada tazawwajat awnan akhahu wa qada and would later marry after Omar's death Muhammad bin Ja'far when he died she in turn married his brother Aun when he also died uh, you know one of the things that you should take from this is the women there was no stigma in divorce or widowhood uh, unfortunately in the South Asian culture uh, and I think it relates more to Hinduism because in Hinduism the dharma of a woman was service to the husband so when the husband died if you were from the uh, the warrior c caste, you were supposed to self-emulate yourself, just throw yourself on a fire. Um, but the, it, that, that's the dharma of a woman in, in classical Hinduism. Was The dharma is like her, uh, her ibadah, her suluk. It was to serve her husband. If the husband died, then she waited for death. And... So unfortunately, in, in, some, in the, some of the South Asian culture, if, if, if a, a woman loses her husband when she's in her 20s, she, it's, it's, she's, nobody's going to marry her. Uh, but in this culture, marriage was very fluid. And, and people got married. They got divorced. Uh, it's not encouraging divorce, but divorce was not this massive. I mean, I, I meet people that are in horrible marriages. I'm just like, get a divorce. You know, it's not, you know, really, if you're in a horrible marriage where you're miserable, because the worst thing about it is ingratitude. You just, it's hard to be in a state of gratitude with Allah if you're miserable. And so it's just important for your psychological well-being to be in an environment where you're happy with the person you're with, and, and there's no reason why you shouldn't be happy with the person you're with. So... I mean, I would much rather be alone than be with somebody I hated, uh, really. Uh, so, I, you know, it's important to take from this that this was very fluid. Uh, these women were uh, marrying, uh, the, you know, s somebody would die and they would marry, the, like the sister. They'd marry the sister. If, the, if, if the, the, the wife died and the sister was available, they would marry the sister. It wasn't like this big stigma. It was quite the contrary. It was a natural, uh, very natural thing to do. فَنَكَحَتْ أَخَاهُ عَبْدَ اللَّهُ وَعِنْدُهُ مَاتَتْ بِرَشْتِبَاهِ She married his brother Abdullah and she died without a doubt while still married to him. مَعْ إِبْنِهَا زَيْدٍ بِوَقْتٍ وَاحِدِي فَكَانَ بِهِ سُنَنٌ لِنَّاقِدِي her son Zayd ibn Umar died at the same time she did, thus giving precedent for scholars who derive rulings of inheritance from such situations. So there's actually a ruling derived from this situation because it was quite unusual. Uh, she died at the same time that her son died. So there was a, uh, how, a complication on how her inheritance should be distributed. A few months after the chosen one's death, either three or six, according to the strongest views. Um, so the chosen and beloved's daughter died, the mother of distinguished noble. So there's a khidaf, three or six, but uh, six is, the, I think, the strongest. Wallahu alam. Um, what time is it? 3.15 Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Allahumma salli wa sallam wa baraka ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam taslima Allahumma gfir lana wa rahamna wa tab'alina ya rahama ar-rahimin Allahumma anzal alayna al-barakat Allahumma ja'an mahabbata rasulika sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fi qulubina Allahumma ja'an ma'arifata siratihi fi qulubina Allahumma ja'al hadha nabiyya al-kareem ahabba al-nasi ilayna ya rahama ar-rahimin wa ahabba min anfusina ya rahama ar-rahimin Allahumma tahir bi sirati al-atira qulubana ya arham rahimin wa ja'alna sarikina subluhu ya allah allahumma ja'alna sarikina subluhu ya allah allahumma ja'alna sarikina subluhu ya allah allahumma tahhir alsinatana wa qulubana min ar-riya'i wa sam'ati wa al-'ujbi wa al-bughdi wa al-haqdi wa kulli shay'in yub'iduna 'anka ya arham ar-rahimin 
اللهم وفقنا لما تحب وترضى اللهم امتنا على السنة والجماعة اللهم امتنا على السنة والجماعة اللهم امتنا على السنة والجماعة اللهم يا أرحم الراحمين اجعلنا عند المصطفى صلى الله عليه وسلم عند الحوض اللهم اجعله يسقينا من يدي الكريمة يا الله اللهم اجعله يسقينا من يدي الكريمة يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم اجعله مقبلا علينا مبتسما حينما يرانا اللهم اجعله أحب الناس إلينا يا الله اللهم اجعله أحب الناس إليه يا الله اللهم اجعل ألسنتنا مكثرة من ذكره ومن الصلاة عليه يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم ارزقنا رؤيته في 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 منامتنا يا الله اللهم اجعل رؤيته في منامتنا يا الله اللهم اجعل رؤيته يا رحم الراحمين في نومنا أنت رحم الراحمين يا الله اللهم وفق هؤلاء الحاضرين اللهم وفق القائمين على هذا الشيء اللهم وفق ولاة أمورنا اللهم وفق الأمير الذي أكمنا بالنزول في هذه الأماكن المباركة يا الله اللهم وفق الشيخ عبد الله بن بيا والشيخ عبد الله القاضي سيدي عبد الهادي وسيدي يحيى وهؤلاء القائمين وعيشة سبحاني وكل من ساعى لهذا الشيء يا الله اللهم وفقنا لما تحب وترضى يا أرحم الراحمين سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون والسلام على المسلم والحمد لله رب العالمين